Please join me to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge of allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, flag of the United States, States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we sit down, uh, can we just have a moment of silence oh, yes. for Stan Brown? Stan was a uh, longtime resident of this town and a good friend of a lot of people. This town, uh, he was a good businessman, and uh, he'll be sorely missed. So. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Hampton Board of Selectmen's meeting for July 2nd, 2018. First thing we will have is a public hearing, RSA 419A, the question of the increased cost for the purchase of grave sites from the Hampton cemeteries. The proposed cost increase for the purchase of one grave site is from 351, 361, 376, and five and 651 to 701. Fred, have you got? Mr. Chairman, this is a request of the Board of Cemetery Trustees. Uh, this brings the town in line with the other towns in the general area. Uh, we've been underselling all of them as far as our cemetery lots are concerned, and it was felt that we should at least come up to the average of other communities so the money could be properly invested for, pe for perpetual care of the cemeteries. Is there any questions from the audience, the public? Seeing none, I'll bring that back to the board. Yes. Um, do we know when the last rate increase occurred? No, we don't. We don't. So it's been like this, the current rates quite have a been there years. for quite a number of years. Is there any, how much space is left? Has anybody told us? Oh, actually, us? there's a substantial amount of space. There's a reasonable time. amount of space. And what about cremated remains? I know that Uda Pinio was talking about this when she was running for cemetery trustee. And in the modern days, she has some kind of proposal. I don't remember what you call the thing, but mm -hmm. is that something that we could ask the trustees to uh, investigate? They are already doing that. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Anybody else from the board? Seeing none, we need a motion? Yes, sir, you do. So I need a motion that we increase the uh, gravesite, the proposed cost increase one gravesite from 351, 361, 376, 651 to 701. Have a motion? Is there a second? A second. All those in favor? Unanimous. And this chair won't move forward, so I'm just swapping chairs. Oh. I don't know what's the matter with the stupid thing. But I don't like these chairs. Don't like them. Public comment. Is there any public comment tonight? Good evening. Betty Moore, 375 Ocean Boulevard. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Historical Society. This seems to be my monthly gig. Um, and I'm here to invite the community to our Hamptons 380th celebration uh, coming up in a couple of weekends on Saturday, July 14th. It's from noon to 4 p.m. at the Tuck Museum. Uh, we have a number of organizations that are going to be with us for the afternoon. Um, we have demonstrations, the Garden Club will be there, the Hampton Arts Network is going to be doing plein air painting, the Alumni Association will have a display, we'll have demonstrations, we're going to be showing some um, videos the museum has produced over the years in the Tuck Building, we'll have some antique cars and a fire engine, um, the Masonic Lodge is selling hamburgers and hot dogs, and the um, Experience Hampton is providing complimentary cake. So it should be a nice afternoon, and um, you can round out the day at the Congregational Church where they're having a lobster dinner. So we hope people will join us for part of the day or all of it. Um, and you can check our website at HamptonHistoricalSociety.com for more information. And the other thing I would like to do is thank the community for voting for the museum. Um, you had brought it up, Mary Louise, the, um, our community, your e-vote from the Provident Bank. Um, I just didn't want to be embarrassed by the amount of votes, but we got um, about five-fold more than we had the year before. So I want to thank everyone that 
heard my plea and voted for us. And um, thank you very much. Thank you for your hard work, Betty, truly. Anybody else from the public? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jay Diener, 206 Woodland Road in Hampton, and I'm here representing the Seaport Hamptons Estuary Alliance. Um, in uh, a few weeks ago, we held the first of three flood-related mm -hmm. workshops um, at the Masonic Lodge, where we touched on some basic issues related to flooding, um, trying to inform the residents of Hampton and actually all surrounding communities who live in flood-prone areas about how to become more flood smart. Um, we had about 60 people at that workshop. Um, we're expecting that we'll have as many on at this workshop. It is going to be on July 17th. Um, it starts at 545. It'll be at the Masonic Lodge once again at 77 Tide Mill Road. Um, for this workshop, we're just going to cover two topics, one of which is going to be flood insurance. And um, Jennifer Gilbert, who is from the New Hampshire Office of Strategic In Initiatives, she's also our liaison with the National Flood Insurance Program, is going to be there speaking about who needs flood insurance, who should have flood insurance, even if they don't need it. Um, uh, various issues related to purchasing flood insurance, how you can reduce your claims, or rather your premiums, uh, what to do if you need to file a claim. There'll be plenty of time for question and answers. Uh, we're also going to be talking about raising structures, uh, what the process is, um, what the issues are that you need to be aware of, what the costs are. Uh, we're going to have several experts who are involved in that from a technical perspective come and speak, and we're also going to have a local resident who's in the process of raising her home tell you about what it is from her perspective. So we invite everybody to come and learn a little bit more and become a little bit more flood smart so we can all collectively um, work together to make our properties more resilient. Um, as with the last workshop, there will be a light dinner served uh, prior to it. There's no charge to attend, but we do ask that you do pre-register. Um, we have information on the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance Facebook page. There'll be flyers upstairs in the town hall, one at the library, and we'll do our best to spread them around. So thank you very much. We hope to see you all there. Are you leaving after now, or are you going to be? Or are you sitting here going to watch the meeting? Why are you asking? I got something here that you're going to want and take a look at. Okay, should I wait? It's no, no, I want to give it to you. You can look it up later. I, I, tried to, <laughs> I tried to get that. I, I didn't have time to walk over there. and Check it out. You'll be interested in it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else from the public that would like to speak? <laughs> Mr. Nyan. Good evening, uh, John Nyan, representing the uh, Hampton Area Chamber of Commerce this evening. I just wanted to uh, bring to the attention to the board uh, and also ask a, a favor. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, the Hampton Beach Village District, along with the Hampton Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, decided to go into a partnership and fund a, um, a mobile app that would provide um, parking information and other uh, types of information to visitors of Hampton Beach, whether or not you're coming in for a day or a week or a month. Uh, we worked with a, uh, an IT company out of Manchester who helped us build the application, and uh, we are officially rolling it out today, uh, July 2nd. Um, it includes uh, parking information on 11 parking lots, uh, three from the town, one from the state, two from the Hampton Beach Village District, and the remaining um, parking lots are from chamber member parking lots. Uh, along <clears throat> with the parking lot information, it will share to the person who downloads it uh, where to park, how much uh, that parking lot is costing, and it's, uh, a, uh, it's interactive. So as the price of the parking lot changes, so does the application. Um, it will also give you uh, or the person on the, on the phone the ability to get directions um, and find out also if there's availability in a particular parking lot. Over and above the information on the 11 parking lots, we also have 
uh, a drop-down menu, uh, which will then share with people where to eat, where to stay, um, all of the events uh, that are taking place on the, uh, the main stage, um, a lot of medical information. So if somebody has to uh, go to Exeter Hospital or Portsmouth, that information is shared. Um, and as I said, it's very interactive so that we have a back uh, office of the application so that when any of the parking attendants have a change that they want to announce, so let's say the Ashworth uh, uh, parking uh, area goes from $10 to $15, the parking attendant texts um, the chamber, and then we download that change right away so people know up-to-date information on parking and parking cost and availability. Um, so the favor that I, I would like to ask is that uh, we are doing a, a major social media uh, blitz uh, to get this word out and I would like permission to send it over to your IT department and possibly put it on your website. Oh. Can sign this to the board? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll do it. Okay. We'll have it done tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Seeing none, bring it back to the board for announcements and community calendar. There it is. Well, we had an exciting day at the beach today, obviously, with a huge problem of trash. Um, I talked with Chairman Stiles of the HBAC, and she has been following up. Uh, two days before the 4th of July, and we have an overwhelming trash problem down there. I suppose the state is asleep. I don't know how else to account for it. Uh, I had my ear chewed by a nice lady who was in the town office when I was picking up my paperwork. Um, and uh, apparently social media, which I never touch, was awash with pictures and comments and whatever. Not a nice way to start the season. We need, and I believe Nancy made a, a suggestion by email later today, we need to sit down with the state of New Hampshire and figure out what's going on down there. Anything else? Well, I think that's enough for one day. Gina? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Mary Louise. The trash was an issue. I actually didn't make it down there today, but from what I saw, people were upset. But I guess that they're saying it's something to do with staffing amazingly busy day down there and I understand it's excuse but I think people need to realize that our public works department picks up the trash every single day all summer long on the side streets too so I think that we do need to sit down I agree with Mary Louise and I agree with Chairman Stiles that is a good idea because I've gone down and I talked to Meredith the, op the operations manager down there and I think she does attempt to do a good job but something is not quite right and I think we need to figure out that this doesn't happen again, especially this coming week. But on a good note, I like to say that I went to uh, Dave Hartnett and Kawasaki Hartnett's cookout in honor of our police, fire, and public works departments. And I just wanted to thank them. Past summers, I haven't been able to go, but I was able to attend this year, and it was a uh, good time had by the Hartnett's and some members of the chamber. Chairman Bridal was there, and it was fun. I just wanted to say thank you. Jim? Yeah, I'll agree on the trash. I, I was down the beach twice, Saturday and Sunday. Um, but I also, I saw a lot of positive things going on down there too. I saw one of the state workers making sure that the, the boardwalk for the accessibility of the beach was cleaned off and doing a very good job of it. I stopped and talked with a couple of the lifeguards, young lifeguards who were extremely interested in the beach, extremely interested in the people and extremely interested in the safety of the people on the beach. So I agree 100% with the trash and we got to sit down with the state and work that out. But there also is a lot of positive and I think people need to know that, that there's a lot of positive going on there, down there too and we work through these problems and it'll go well. Rick? Um, yeah, I would like to uh, again uh, uh, say something nice about Stan Brown, you know, what a great yeah. guy he was and how um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Stan, the, uh, the precinct fire station was uh, either donated or built or sold or something from Stan's father. And he has a long history of uh, doing a lot of good things for Hampton. And we here at the Board of Selectmen have uh, worked with him many times. 
in getting things accomplished that needed to be done. So it can't be said enough what a good uh, neighbor and friend that he was to many people. Um, yeah, I can. I didn't really. Um, I di didn't notice the trash. I wasn't down there like I usually would be because uh, I was doing some other things. But I will tell you, it has been very busy. All of a sudden, it went from nothing <clears throat> to being very busy. It's very, very noisy. It's one of the noisiest summers I've seen to start out with. The motorcycles are intolerable. Uh, and I can hear them all night. And uh, so I think that there's a lot of uh, people down there. And I, uh, you know, the police must be doing a great job um, because they seem to be, it seems to just go on almost the whole night, the motorcycles and everything else. And I'm hoping that uh, they're able to keep everything together that needs to be done. Thank you. All right. And I was down the beach all weekend and a couple of times today. And yes, the state does have to work a little bit on their, their, their problem down there. I understand they had some problems with equipment and stuff, but I'm sure if they had reached out to us, we could have helped them out at that point in time. Uh, this afternoon, everything up down there was all cleaned up. They, they got their stuff done, and uh, so it was. So as we move forward, uh, again, I want to make sure that, that it is clean, and I think they have addressed that. I think they're working on it, and I think we're going to make sure that, that our portion of it is, is clean for this week. And uh, uh, I can't say enough good things about the, uh, the public works on, on the job they did this weekend, along with the police and fire. Uh, police were down there. There was a lot of them down there. They, they, they brought some of these people in from other towns to help us out. Uh, I, I was listening to the fire department. At one point, they had all three ambulances out at, one, at once. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they've all been busy. And, and you're right, Rick. Um, you know, we went, it almost seems like three weeks ago, it was still snowing. And uh, <laughs> it was, it's the hot weather we had. So it did come on us really quick. So hopefully we've had this little hiccup and the bugs are out of it and we're going to work fine from there on. Chairman Bardo, can I say one thing before, while we're talking about state parks? Also, I want to say appreciation and a lot of residents down on North Beach, some are not quite as appreciative as most that I've talked to, but the state parks did really pull it together fast and get the staircases uh, well. attempted to get those up and running. I guess two sets of two out of the three is supposed to be able to get walked on tomorrow or Wednesday. Yeah. So I thought considering they didn't get the funding until almost the end of June for it, that that was uh, done pretty expediently. So I'm thankful for that. And Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I have a quick one too. Okay. Since, especially since Chief Sawyer is here, I seem to recall boy, maybe 15 odd years ago, we had a noise, motorcycle noise ordinance. You remember that? We do have an ordinance. Deals I can two. remember somebody worked pretty hard on that in the police department. Yeah, you have two two items. You have a state statute that is measured by decibels, and it's a very very difficult yeah. statute to enforce. Yeah. Um, the town ordinance seems to work better. That when somebody's sitting in an intersection and just revving the engine, that wouldn't yeah. be a violation, whether it's a motorcycle or a vehicle. Yeah. And we do write a lot of summonses on that. But a lot of the noise you hear is as motorcycles take off from locations. Once they get out of the traffic, they hit that open area and they throttle up. Believe it or not, most of those are not violations of the state law and wouldn't be a violation of our ordinance. Our ordinance deals particularly with those vehicles that are just sitting idly or squealing their tires. So uh, I know. To me, it was a big problem at the beach at the time and people were. Every year. Going around. Every year. The city of Portsmouth, along with the New Hampshire State Police, this weekend is conducting a um, come in. No summonses will be issued, but they'll measure your bike so you know whether you're in compliance or not. And we've done that a few times up at uh, Seacoast Highway in Northampton, and we can try to put something like that together again, just as an educational uh, incentive to get people to quiet the bikes down a little bit. I know down at a couple of the establishments on Ashworth Avenue, they've posted signs, please respect our neighbors when you're leaving with the motorcycles, where people frequent with the bikes. Um, but it is an ongoing problem. Yeah, and what happens is when it's late at night, <clears throat> uh, there is no other noise. So when they when that that's happens, it, yeah. that's yeah. what you're going to And it get. echoes where that, that atmospheric yeah. issue we talk about from the beach hitting, going up towards the North Shore and Boar's Head, it's like an amplifier. It just yeah, blows that noise right on top of those people. Yeah. On yeah. Ocean Boulevard, whatever, yeah. you know, the, at night it really does travel because yeah. there is no other background. But it's hard to believe, but most of those things aren't violations of state law. They're yeah, just no, a, they're sure a nuisance. So the motorcycle lobby is a very powerful lobby in our legislature. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to get that changed has been uh, an uphill battle.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we'll have the uh, approval of minutes, the June 11th minutes. I will so move for the correction. Okay, what's the correction? On page seven of nine, uh, when I was discussing impact fees and the school impact fees, uh, I referenced both SAU 90 and SAU 21 impact fees were assessed. So that should be added on page seven. Okay. About the middle of the page. I'll second with the edit. With the amendment. All those in favor as amended? Unanimous. I'll move the minutes of the non public session of June 18. Okay. Second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. I'll move the public session minutes of June 18. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Consent agenda. There. We have uh, the Cable Renew Committee yeah, appointment sure. of Frank DeLuca. We have dance hall permits. We have the Hampton Cemetery deeds. We have a parade and public gathering. We have uh, raffle permits. We have a road closure permit. We have uh, seafood festival sidewalk vendor licenses. I would like to, uh, not that I'm opposed to them, but I would like to pull off um, number four and number six before we yes i'll second that i have that circled okay so all with the exception of four and six unanimous number in, in my re well you want to go ahead first mary louise yes this is these road races really upset neighborhoods and i it looks like they're trying to do a little different this year or have a little different route but this is a a an intrusion into neighborhoods 1a not so bad except at this time of year probably i guess they're going to do this in the fall but uh i object to having public roads closed which impede taxpayers from doing what they normally do some people call me and tell me they couldn't get to church because they were trapped in their houses I have a real problem with these road races. So I, I don't have a problem with the road race itself. Matter of fact, the one at Smutty Nose, it was just last week that had 2,000 people. Uh, they went right by my house. Uh, they're all well run. They do that. And uh, they're there 15, 20 minutes. The thing is, they also notify everybody. They send out mailers. They post it on the streets. Uh, they do a good job at notifying people. And it brings in not only brings in because we, it, with 2,000 people, I know a number of Hampton people were in that and they enjoy running and I think that's not a problem. Mm. So um, I have no problem with them running road races. My only concern is, and we've talked about it on this board before, is that when they do have a road race or a large gathering and they require an ambulance there, that ambulance should be a Hampton ambulance. If you're having private ambulances running around town, the, the police department and the fire department should know about it. So they should be the ones Absolutely. That, that do that. Yeah. So I, I think either we make part of the permit that the fire chief has to sign off on both of them, or the requirement is that if an ambulance is required for any public gathering or road race, that they be required, just as you do with, with a police detail, that it be a Hampton ambulance. So that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, I agree with that. And I, I just want to mention that, that uh, they contribute a lot to charities in town. Absolutely. Too. A lot of the money they bring in, they contribute yeah. to That's charities. right. And they do a great job. Which, which yeah, is, so. yeah. And about the actual race itself, yes, they not only do they bring people to the beach in off times, but people that don't participate them, Hampton residents, enjoy going down and watching them and having, you know, the people around. And it's really good for businesses, hotels, and pretty I, much throughout the town. And I think a lot of people, even just the people that live in those neighborhoods, I couldn't tell you how many people were out on the street at my at my neighborhood out there cheering yeah, people on and, and, and getting them to go. So it's a it's a good family event. And they do a great job at notifying people. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll make the motion that we that we approve that with the stipulation that it is a town ambulance and, we'll, and, we'll, and as we move forward we'll do that on every road race yes. or every large gathering permit. Yes, and, and agree. So we can do that as a board, correct? Yes, sir, you can. I'll All second right. that motion. We have a motion and a second. All right. those in no, favor. Wait, wait, one second. So that's an amendment or a flat-out motion? That is a motion that we allow them to have okay. uh, 
that, we that require. if they, that we require that, and that'll be a selectman's ordinance or out of the okay. however it's worded that it'd be required that uh, they have a town a town of Hampton ambulance. Yeah. So, okay. So we have a motion, a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Yeah. So now are you going to vote on the so road race? So now we'll race? have a motion for the number four and number six. Yeah. I'll make the motion. We move those items. I'll second them. All in favor? Four opposed. opposed. One opposed. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Appointments. <laughs> Chief Sawyer. And I won't call him that deputy four-legged animal. I didn't bring it up. I'm not smiling. I, I didn't. <laughs> no, no. The chairman, and some the other chairman. Chairman. No, no, no. <laughs> no, leave me out of it. That day will win Deputy me. Hobbs, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Glad to see you. Good evening. Uh, I would just like to take a moment to offer my personal condolences also to Stan Brown's family. Uh, when I came to Hampton in this department, I, I got a chance to meet Stan at a lot of the, <clears throat> the veterans' events and uh, just a great historian of the town, a great family, uh, and just those times that I get to spend with him will be surely missed as the whole town would miss a man of that experience and just a great heart. Uh, moving forward, I just want to talk about the parking lots real quick. It's not in the report. Just want to mention that things are going well um, with some of the changes we made just trying to increase the safety and security of our employees and for the, our patrons. Um, one of the things we were doing, we talked about that program for the employees. I've had a lot of people since the vote was taken showing up at the PD. I just remind everybody that uh, we will be sending out a letter, I hope, by the end of the week to the Chamber of Commerce to help us in this endeavor. Uh, we had to order the materials to create the uh, placards. Those just came in uh, at the end of last week. So we won't be in business for that probably until after the 4th of July holiday. Uh, probably the week after we'll be able to get that started. So if you're interested in that program, just see your employer. The letter will go out hopefully to the chamber by Friday and we can get that rolling as quick as possible. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And I've given you each a copy of my report. At the uh, Marchtown meeting, SAU 90 sponsored a warrant article to fund an additional school re resource officer position. Mm -hmm. The warrant article passed with strong support, increasing our full time staffing level from 34 to 35. In April, Officer Clay DeMarco and Officer Shannon Feely were selected as SRO detective. Detective Feely will be assigned to the center in Marston Schools, filling the newly created position. Detective DeMarco will be assigned to the Hampton Academy, replacing Detective Matthew Robinson, who has served admirably as an SRO for the past three years and is returning to the patrol division. Officer Robert DeWatto began the 176th New Hampshire Police Academy in April and will be graduating on August 17th. Upon graduation, Officer DeWatto will return to the patrol division to complete a field training program. On April 23rd, Special Part-Time Officer Howie Felch was appointed as a full-time officer and will attend the 177th New Hampshire Police Academy, Academy commencing August 27, 2018. On June 22nd, we began our summer season. <coughs> officer Jason Jackson, Vitaly Sorokins, and Matthew Robinson were selected to serve as corporals. Corporal serves as direct supervisors for our part-time special officers during our busiest times at the beach. HPD utilizes three corporals due to the increasing levels of visitors to the beach and the decreasing levels of experience with our part-time special officer ranks. Yeah. Part-time, current staffing level is 34 sworn. Currently we have the 34 part-time officers on our roster. Two part-time officers are currently on a leave of absence, bringing the number of working part-time officers to 34. On May 11th, the department had 12 new part-time officers graduate from the 275th New Hampshire Part-Time Officer Academy. Wow. Of the working part-time officers, 14 are on probationary status with less than two years of service to the department. Recruitment. On April 8, 2017, we began a testing process for part-time officer candidates to attend the Part-Time Officer Academy starting in August. The department received 206 applications for the test, 36 actually registered for the test, and between dropouts and withdrawals during the screening questionnaire, 25 applicants took the written test. After the written test, 19 successful applicants moved on to the physical agility test. At the, of the, excuse me, at the conclusion of the physical agility test, 11 applicants were extended an invitation to the oral board interview. Those candidates who successfully complete the interview were given conditional officers employment and began the next phase of the hiring process, which included a thorough background investigation, polygraph examination, and psychological evaluation. After this extensive process, the department has enrolled six recruits 
for the 276 New Hampshire Part-Time Officer Training Academy uh, beginning on August 11th. The department's next part-time officer testing process will co commence on October 6, 2018. Anyone interested in employment with the Hampton Police Department should visit our website, hamptonpd.com, and file an application electronically. This testing process will be for placement in the part-time officer academy beginning in February of 2019. Department operations. Ongoing issues with, her uh, and that should read opiate, not just heroin. Uh, with opiate have plagued the, re uh, plagued the region. Hampton has four overdose deaths attributed to opiates in the first half of 2018. We continue to work with local, state, and federal partners to combat this issue. Uh, Preseason beach activity started out slow due to the wet and cool weather experienced in the region. Our officers did an outstand jo outstanding job maintaining order during those hot, busy days when schools across the region would have skip days and their students would descend upon Hampton Beach. We've continued the program of bringing in experienced officers from other munis municipalities to augment our staffing levels and this has proven to be very helpful in maintaining order and providing for good traffic flow through the beach area. Special thanks to the New Hampshire State Police, University of New Hampshire Police Department, Epping Police Department, Exeter Police Department, and the uh, Seabrook Police Department, who all provided personnel and equipment to assess with, assist with the preseason. The department also continues its operational planning for the many special events scheduled out to the fall to include the 4th of July, Children's Week, Labor Day weekend, Seafood Festival, and a variety of running and bicycle events and activity. Mm. Calls for service are up 2%. Motor vehicle stops are down 6%. Mm. Arrest down 10%. Uh, concerning is DWI is up 18%. Mm. Drug offenses down 30%. Incidents reported up 5%. Offenses down 4%. Felonies are up 4%. Our parking enforcement is uh, doing a great job with the new folks we have. It's up 63%, and accidents are up 3%. And I'll entertain any questions from the board. Mary Louise. Yes, good evening. Um, thank you for agreeing, like the other department heads, to provide your quarterly information to the budget committee. That should help everyone when you, we sit down to do next year's budget. Um, now, I emailed Fred earlier today. But I have a question. The poor town clerk is going crazy trying to get people to come in and register their dogs. Is there any way that, uh, and I don't know whether Fred, uh, I, I asked Fred earlier, can we publish a list of individuals who have failed? To I would have to research as to whether that's legal to do. Yeah. Uh, just know that we do send out a registered letter and officers when we can and the animal control officer get lists of these folks and we go knock on their doors the best we can. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that people, when their pets pass away, they don't notify us. So we bring, it kind of makes them relive it. So that's a difficult thing when we do that, that you know, their dog passed away and we're knocking on the door. Why did they register them? The other thing is we do have a bit of a transient population uh, down at the beach. So a lot of those people move away. And so that contributes to a lot you of the You look at uh, that issues. list. It's oh, in established areas. Yeah. I don't see why the town clerk should have to go crazy and send out notice after notice after notice. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm just going to plead a little bit to see if we can get some of this problem with registering dogs. I believe the way she does it is the way the statute says she has yeah. to do that. Yeah. So, right. But enough so we can't, we can't change the statute here. So. Next uh, question, and you have a um, mention in your report about the um, getting help from other officers, state police, UNH, and, and all that. You're low on specials. Yes. The department's probably as low as I've seen it. And We're bordering on the lowest number I've experienced in my time yeah. with the department, where we, we were allowed to have up to 70. Yep. And to put it in perspective, yep. when, when I took over as deputy chief and I was responsible for the scheduling, mm -hmm. I had somewhere between 55 and 60 officers working over 250 shifts a week. Currently, we have, um, I believe it's 25 uh, part-timers. Uh, pardon me, we're up to the, the number I just gave you. Yep. Um, but again, of the 32, 14 have less than two years' experience. There is nobody left on our roster from the class of 2017. Now, we've hired two of them, but the other folks went off to other endeavors. Uh, and that's really what we're looking at. If we get two summers out of a special, we're fortunate because we're grabbing, as, as we are in that zone of retirement that we're experiencing, mm -hmm. we're grabbing 
people as quickly as we can so we don't lose them. Mm -hmm. But if you go up to the city of Manchester, Nashua, Salem, Derry, State Police, um, a half of Salem PD started in Hampton. I think we're over 20 with the city of Nashua, and I'm sure we're over 20 with the city of Manchester. And UNH took two last year, and the Mass State Police took two. So while we do a great job, I will say we do the best job in the state of New Hampshire training police officers. Everybody yeah. knows that. Oh, yeah. So if you come in and your, your resume has Hampton on it, you're going to the top of the pile. Two aspects to this problem. First of all, are the special officers getting enough opportunity to do the routine details and stuff to help add to the money that they're making in the summer. In other words, do they have enough of an opportunity to, uh, I mean, that's... By contract with the yeah. HPA, we are required any extra work, be it um, overtime, grants, mm -hmm. or details, have to be offered uh, by seniority to the full-time officers twice. Yeah. And then it goes to the part-time officers. Right. Because my concern a little bit here is that we are bringing in a lot of officers from other, and I, I realize you have to yep. do that if you need the staffing. Yeah, we had a discussion with the union before we went down the road yeah. of, of this program uh, to try to address our shortages, and I gave assurances to the union, and I think if, you, if the union you know, wanted to speak to it, yeah. they would tell you, my promise was this, I will never offer any work in Hampton that doesn't go through your ranks first. Yeah. And we, we've lived by that, uh, we've abided by that, uh, and they've been very open because they are, you know, I have to say we're very fortunate the relationship we have with our bargaining unit. Mm -hmm. They understand the critical need for officers, and if they could provide and guarantee, we wouldn't be doing this. We would use people in Hampton Green. But in the particular time we're in right now, that's just not feasible. Yeah. So they've been very cooperative in helping us with this and, and understanding the motivation behind it, that if we ever get to that point where we have enough uh, sufficient officers wearing our uniform, that we wouldn't need to use that program. Yeah. But the final piece, what cooperation do you get from the state with state police actually serving on the state property, right, on the beach? If there's... They are are really, you having to break away from the Hampton Police Department and and have men serving enforcement on the actual beach the sand? sand? Yeah, absolutely, because that, that is our responsibility. It is not the responsibility of the New Hampshire State Police by New Hampshire law. The only way the New Hampshire State Police can come into this community and serve is at my invitation as the Chief of Police okay. or by order of the Attorney General. Okay. So right now, when you see the troopers down there on Fridays and Saturdays, that yeah. is at our invitation. Okay. Um, I will say this year we have seen a great improvement uh, on the number of troopers we're seeing yeah. simply because we changed the way we were scheduling. We were trying to, to the best benefit of the taxpayer, not waste money. So we were scheduling week to week and looking at the weather forecast that we knew, you know, if we needed so many more guys on Thursday as opposed to Saturday, that's what yeah. we would do. But that makes it harder to fill. The more time we give people, the better chances they're going to sign up okay. and fulfill it. So they've done that this year. So, so far, other than uh, Motorcycle Week, and that's traditionally a tough week for them to have yeah. troopers down here, they have been filling, fulfilling the numbers that we agreed to. So it's been vastly improved compared to the prior two years. So I was just uh, wondering if the state is failing to, or is putting a greater burden on you, shall we say? No, I can't say that. I would say that the state police, uh, uh, I think if there, many of the members of their command staff would tell you okay. the relationship they have with the Hampton Police Department is probably the best they have with anybody in the okay. state simply because we work together so much and we work together so well. So they have done their part as far as I'm concerned, uh, doing everything they can to give me the, the assets that I need. But again, they're like, they're like the rest of us. We're all kind of mm -hmm. shorthanded right now. Yeah. And again, yeah. I think I've harped on it before that the folks coming into work today, um, and it's not a criticism, they just they work differently than we do. Yeah. When I when I first came here, if they had 80 hours opportunity, you'd, you'd go to work for 80 yeah. hours, yeah. which we now know probably is not a good idea. Um, these folks, they want to do their 40, and the work they produce for us is outstanding. Good. But they're less likely to take the, as much extra as the people yeah. in generations past, and that's, yeah. that's throughout law enforcement in the country. You talk to any police chief, go to the conferences, they're all talking about the same issues. So my it's not youngest, just us. My youngest son and youngest daughter both served as specialists I sure them. I remember on the department, and uh, I, I get it. But I wish you a successful summer, gentlemen. Thank you. It's going to be a challenge. It will be, but we're up to it. Regina? Yeah, thank you for the report.
thanks for what you do. And I want to say probably when I was working down there full time, which was, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 years ago, I know you guys definitely had way more part timers oh, than you do yeah. now, like yeah, probably yeah. closer to 40 or 50. And most of them, if you ask them when they were getting out, they had got on at three, they work until 11, and then they work at 11 to seven. Yeah. That was a double from three o'clock yeah. in the afternoon yeah. to seven o'clock in the morning. And probably 80% of the cops did that. And that's when we had more of them. So yeah. that's why we need to bring in the other towns. And I'm glad to see the stadies are back up here more. Good. So that will help you out. But thank you. Great job. Jim? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, recruitment, 36 original down to six, mm -hmm. right? So is that is that a normal attrition rate? On that's what we're experiencing. What you're seeing today, um, there's been some talk about changing the rules in New Hampshire to the Police Stands and Training Council. A lot of the things are some of the, the, the errors of youth that people make. And it's the drug use issues. Uh. Marijuana, any use of marijuana within a year, you disqualified. Any other drug is three years. Illicit or if you use somebody else's prescription. And what we've been seeing a lot of, the trend we've been seeing is people come in and they borrowed a roommate's Adderall or something like that, you know, that a lot of people are using to study for tests and those type of things. And we've seen a trend of that, not just here, but across the state. And it disqualifies you for three years. We don't have a choice on that. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of those things are being really looked at hard by the police standards and training council as to whether we need to change and adapt to current culture. Um, I'm not a big one for lowering your standards, but, you know, we're still battling with the potential of legalizing marijuana, what implications is that going to have? <clears throat> so a lot of those numbers that you see drop off are those issues, and the other one is physical conditioning. Uh, we run a <laughs> physical conditioning test. If you, The process would be you'd come in and take the test, and if you pass, we score the test right there, we immediately take you outside, and we put you through the physical conditioning test. And the number of people that can't meet that standard is just <laughs> astounding. The, the lack of physical fitness uh, is troubling. We lose a lot of people at that level. We really don't lose a lot of people at the background of the polygraph stage. It's the initial test, uh, the drug use questions that immediately disqualify you. We'll, we'll bring people out and we'll give them a little piece of paper that says, if you've done any of the following, please meet, us up, meet outside. And we explain to them that there's no point to you taking the test because you can't, you can't qualify as a police officer. So wow. between those two items, we lose a lot of people. Yeah. Well, and with different states legalizing, that's going to be a real problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be. I think it's going to wind up being if there's plans that somebody's going to introduce legislation nationally to drop that federal prohibition. But the problem you're going to still have, mm. similar to airline pilots, pilots or over-the-road uh, uh, CL, uh, CLDs, is still going to be prohibited. I think there'll yeah. still be a prohibition for anybody carrying a firearm in law enforcement yeah. from yeah. from consuming marijuana. So, but that remains to be seen. Mm. And the opiate problem. Going down? I mean, but still there, going down? No, my, my, I'll give you my interpretation only because we talk regionally that while our numbers started out not so good, it, it really leveled off quick. Um, knock on wood, we haven't had one in a couple of months. I think part of the problem is, is the folks that are using it are getting smart about how they use it. Things like Narcan are, are available over the counter. So oh. we've had those instances where somebody ODs and somebody else Narcan before the fire department got to them. You know, and, and it's saving lives, um, but is it really, I think we'd have to, I'd have to talk to the fire chief to look at the overall numbers of overdoses that they've dealt with as a medical issue to get a true grasp on that. No, I don't believe that uh, we've turned the corner yet, no. My belief is no. DWI's up 18%, better mm -hmm. enforcement or more DWI's? I would say because of the, uh, in my four short years as chief, I've hired seven full-time officers. Um, and they're very uh, enthusiastic. They're out there trying to learn their trade. And one of the biggest things we deal with is impaired drivers in this community. Uh, we have, I think, the fourth largest concentration of liquor licenses in the state. So with that, we're going to get our fair share, and they're just very good at going out and detecting them and apprehending them. So I, I will attribute. I don't. I have no information to indicate that there's a, a greater consumption going on. I think it's a better group, a, a younger, more enthusiastic team out there enforcing it. And on the, on the ticketing, I see uh, Paul Hamill out there all the time. He's doing a great, doing a great job. Yeah, he is. Um, Bobby Turcott and uh, Mr. Fosco came in. So for a while there, we had Jim, who was uh, now our evidence tech, um, who was kind of the all-time great. And they've all kind of taken it as a personal challenge that they're going to 
Yeah. You know, and I just made sure, make sure the tickets are valid. Do not be writing tickets, just to write tickets. Because we get the complaints and we do get those. So we try to deal with those in a very uh, fair manner. Thanks for the report. Yeah, thanks for the report. It, um, it looks like you're doing a great job there and that's, we, everyone appreciates it. Um, this morning when I started to watch the news, um, it was troubling to see that there was, was a big fight went on somewhere and 10 people were like arrested. I'm not sure if it was Manchester or... It's Manchester. Uh, it was, there was, was a baseball it? bats involved. Yeah. yeah, I read that. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my, you know, so I was talking to one of my clients and they said, yeah, we got to close the borders. And I'm thinking, they all had blonde hair. You got to close the borders to Maine and Vermont. <laughs> well, I've advocated putting the bridge up on the 4th of July, but nobody wants to take any advice. Because they weren't, uh, those yeah. are just, regu they were people that weren't, uh, whatever, immigrants or what people think are the ones that are causing all the problems. They look like people, everyday people. So have you seen an increase in that type of uh, situation at the, the Violence beach? like that? Yes. Yeah. It, it's sporadic when it happens. I would say that in the time um, from I started in 1995 here, that actually that type of activity overall has lessened. When it happens, it's mm. incredibly violent. Mm. Okay, people, I don't know what it is, people go to weapons a lot quicker. In the old days, there'd be a couple of people down on the beach fighting, and we'd go down and break them up or pepper spray them or whatever we had to do to break up the crowd, and it went away very quickly. Today, you, you do see groups of people um, that unfortunately resort to weapons, bats, knives, firearms, uh, very quickly. And the things tend to, in my opinion, escalate a lot quicker than they used to. That said, with the presence we have down there, and those, you know, we're pretty good at identifying our hot spots, uh, especially at closing time with the, with the uh, bars that we break up our groups into teams to cover certain block areas, so that when the uh, when the bars let out, that we quickly move the crowds along, get them to where they're going, so there's less of a chance of that type of activity happening. Activity happening. So, has there been? Um <clears throat> have things been going well when the bars do close at one o'clock compared to the way it used to be when uh, the, I forget the name of it, the one that was a hot spot? Down uh, I would have to say yes because I remember you know, we still you know, bump into some of the folks, uh, retirees and some of the older troopers that come down and they remember the days when we used to line up 20 officers in the, the state park at the south end <laughs> at Haverhill Ave. We'd march everybody across the street, get in your cars and leave. And then for you know about 20 minutes after, we would just start with a bullhorn, start pushing the crowds, and get them into the cars to leave because the state park closes at one o'clock, and we would enforce that nobody was supposed to be there after one o'clock, get them to leave the area, and we would have quite a few arrests out of that because uh, people weren't so compliant back then. Today, we don't see it as much. People, I think, be, people being trying to be smarter about it um, with the entertainment venues we have. Um, we're seeing a lot more Uber, people to getting rides. So we've taken a different approach to it. it used to be people would pull in to that breakdown way or the, uh, the loading areas and we would chase them out. We didn't want the cars there. Now what it is, it's an Uber driver picking up four or five people. Wow. Let them park there, let them get these people and get them to where they're going so we're not dealing with them later on. Because as the night progresses and they've been drinking, they encounter other groups that have been out drinking and that's just not a good formula. So the quicker we can get these po folks, when they come down out of the uh, establishments, the quicker we get them to where they're going. If they're staying at Hampton Beach or into their transportation mode with a, with a sober driver, then that's what we try to encourage. That way we're making fewer arrests and there's fewer conflicts. And so it's been working well with the state police? Oh, absolutely. I would say to this year has been uh, so much better just because we went to the uh, scheduling of, they put out their scheduling a month ahead of time. Now the risk you run with that is, you might get a rainy Saturday night and you have eight to ten troopers down here and there's really not that much to, going on. That's the risk we have to run to make sure we, have, we get the personnel in. And so instead of doing the weekly scheduling, the monthly scheduling seems to be working better and we're getting better support. And then one other thing I wanted to ask is about the, uh, the surveillance cam that you have down there on North Beach. How yes. is that working? That's working well. It, it, it didn't go up without any questions. We had some people in the neighborhood where, you know, we've been getting a lot of complaints up on the North Shore for the speeding. Uh, we have, uh, and I want to be very clear that most of the people that come up there with these car clubs and the truck clubs are very respectful citizens. They're just up there showing off their, their vehicles. But you get a handful, as usual, doing donuts, burnouts, and for some reason the North Shore has become the hot spot for these activities now. 
um, and it's driving some of our you know residents up in that neighborhood a little bit crazy. So we've been up there trying to use unmarked cars. The state police is up there. Traditionally, they used to stay at the main beach. We're sending them up there now with our folks. And one of the things is we just can't always be there. So by putting the camera up there, and the cameras are pointed solely at the roadways, we did have somebody that was concerned that we were going to point the camera in their house. I don't know why they were concerned about that. I have no interest in pointing the camera into their house. Tell it's, me you're nosy. It's, that's my job. <laughs> um, we're, we're strictly using that as, as to enhance our enforcement up there and try to give the people a little bit of peace and quiet up there. If that's disturbing anybody, I apologize. But it is one of the best things we utilize, that when we put that up, it seems to calm the activity down because they know somebody's watching. And finally, I'd like to say there's a lot of people been commenting on Deputy Chief uh, Hobbs. What a good job you do. I've heard it several times from several different people. And he has, he has the toughest there. job in the state of New Hampshire, scheduling policing <laughs> on Hampton Beach. I know I had it for nine years. It's the most difficult job you could ever have. Well, you seem so Great quiet, but you up. seem like a lot of people notice you. That's, so well, thank you. Congratulations. Is that? Oh, okay. Okay, go one more. Sorry, I just have one question about the parking. I know you taught, said that you get complaints about people maybe getting tickets when they shouldn't. Because <laughs> someone said today that they. A lot of times it's when I write the ticket, so <laughs> it may be me. Because <laughs> on the parking situation down on Church Street, because you know how we move the residents yeah. over while they're doing the sewer pipe construction? Yeah, we've had a couple of minor issues with that. And we're, here's the thing we're very accommodating with those type of things. It's sometimes you know people come and they get register their car and they forget to put the sticker on now like this year we've changed the location where the sticker goes right so you're going to have a transition year where some of those are going to be messed up simply because of the month they they register their car so i've already given the order that as long as the stickers on the vehicle in the front somewhere they're good to go don't write tickets on that the back if you put in it it's a five dollar ticket and we're pretty liberal we're not we don't do this to make revenue, even though that's an after thing. It's a five dollar ticket. If somebody has a lot of hot burn over getting a ticket because they put the sticker in the wrong place, as long as they go get a new sticker and put it in the right place, we'll we'll grant an appeal. All right. Thank you, Chief. The only thing I, I have is that you guys, as always, do an awesome job. Uh, uh, I was with the Brown family at, at a point this week, and they were they were very appreciative of both police and fire, and and the uh, care and compassion that you're your officers and your detectives had when they were at the house and they wanted you to know that. So. Thank you very much. Appreciate so. that. Now, aren't you glad you came? Always glad to come and fill the board in on what we're doing when you're on the <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. The next one we have is Allison Eberhardt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Everybody's you. got pass outs tonight. Whoops. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Allison Eberhardt. I work at the University of New Hampshire with the Sea Grant Extension Program. And I'm here tonight to requ request your permission to install some fencing along the area of sand dune that's just south of the inlet in the harbor it's an area we've been referring to as the harborside dunes it's just north of harborside park and the fishermen's co-op and so first i'd like to give you a little bit of background about the project that funded well would fund this effort um, and what the goals are and then give you a little bit more detail about the fencing itself and why we want to do it so this is a project funded by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program. The goal of the project is to increase the resilience of the New Hampshire coast through community-based dune restoration. So we know that sand dunes do a pretty great job at protecting whatever is behind them from waves associated with storms. And so the, this project is looking at making those dune systems as strong and healthy as possible to protect um, infrastructure, homes, businesses in Hampton and Seabrook. And so um, on that front page, you can see a map with three little pins that indicate the three sites that we've been primarily working at under this project. Mm -hmm. The first is your own property. We've been working with um, your conservation commission to develop a restoration plan and implement some restoration at Place Cove or Northside Park. We've been working with state parks at Hampton Beach State Park, and then we've been working with the town of Seabrook, and now I'm before you um, about the harborside dunes. 
And so if you look at the second page, um, you can see an aerial photo of the dune system that I'm, I'm referring to, again, the harborside dunes. And you can see that it's very fragmented. There's this dense network of walking paths. And these walking paths really serve to destabilize the system. So if waves come, these will be your fracture points where the dune erodes. And so what we wanted to do was really understand which of those paths are actually being used by people. People used to be able to park along Route 1A, and they no longer can. Our theory was that this was just a short conduit from their cars, but now that they have to walk, they're probably not walking, you know, a 90-degree angle in. So through this project, we conducted a user survey last summer. Um, we talked with, I think, 45 people representing another 75. Um, to understand their use patterns, to understand which paths they were using, why were they there, what you know, what they were, just to get a sense of how people use the area. Mm -hmm. And what we found is they're primarily using two paths that are indicated on that map, the one running parallel to 1A and then perpendicular. And so um, we have begun installing fencing in the Seabrook town-owned land um, to delineate those two walking paths. And we've initiated restoration efforts to um, both doing some purposeful uh, revegetation and then allowing the dunes to naturally revegetate themselves on those other pathways that are no longer used. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm here to, you can see on that second page, um, what, there's a photograph of what the fencing looks like. It's a uh, five inch diameter wooden posts and then a three quarter inch line. So we really tried to get fencing that was aesthetically pleasing rather than just, you know, metal fence posts and some of the other stuff we've played with in the past. But um, and I should say this is symbolic fencing. It's obviously not going to keep anyone out. It's just to give people an idea that this is where we want you to walk and please their signs indicating as such. But um, we've installed about 140 of these fence posts in the Seabrook owned land. And now I'm here requesting your permission to install an additional 20 in the land to the north that's owned by the town of Hampton. And then if you were to grant permission, I would then seek your permission to um, ask your DPW, your Department of Public Works, if they would assist me in installing those. Questions? Oh, go ahead. Oh. Oh, go ahead. You OK. Um, I don't have a problem with the Place Cove area, but the harbor area that we're looking at here Fred, we have had a big problem with the erosion here. We're having a problem getting that harbor dredged. Uh, Fred, you said there's a significant uh, eating away. Okay. There's uh, approximately 125 to 150 feet of that shoreline on the yeah. harbor end near the bridge that's disappeared yeah, in the last and five years or so. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, um, and I will say we've been, we've had our eye on that. I have a grant proposal going in this Friday that would actually be collecting data on that oh. section because we've observed the same thing. I think um, Hurricane, who's, no, the one last fall did a number there. Oh, yeah. Then there was a big overwash event in the Marsh Nor'easters there. So you actually eroded some areas, but you gained some sand um, on that system. So it is, it's a dynamic system. So if I can point to you, um, on this is one. it just the, the south side of the um... yep so here's the inlet and we would stop right here actually yeah. because this no longer exists since right. March so Cause, we would be because up here it says the, the northern one that's probably not as much erosion it looks like it's all coming in on the south side here and killing the area well, and this that, area actually sustained a ton of damage. Oh, they are as, as well. well. Yeah. So, okay. It did. I'll make the motion to allow this. It's worth a try. I'll second, second it. Yeah. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Work and we'll ask this. Public Works to yeah. get or just tell the ocean to, to ask stop. Public Works to give her a hand. So yeah, we'll have to locate there. the utilities that are buried out there too. Okay. Yeah. Because we do have sewer lines, there's a gas line, and there are two water lines buried out there. That's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. You want to get any of those? So, should I be in touch with you, Mr. Welch? No, should Chris I? Jacobs, our public Chris works Jacobs. director. Okay, talk directly with him. Great. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Next one we have up is Dean Merrill with Experience Hampton to discuss a federal bill grant application. 
Mr. Merrill, how are you? Good. How are you tonight? I see you have Mr. Tinius. Mr. Tinius is going to sit in with me. So. Good evening. So, uh, thank you for putting me on the, the agenda to talk about this issue. But I did want to say a few things before. Um, the, the whole project, or it's not our project, but I'll tell you that the work that the PPW has done, Jen, and, uh, and also Chris, and these two years of working on Route 1, it's, it's been a challenge. But uh, I can tell you that people in that stretch have, uh, have uh, worked with it, and, and it's just been wonderful. And I know when the, she was all excited when the, finally the last piece of, uh, of um, paving got put in. And uh, she, I know she's looking forward to the, to the next step, which would be next spring, to, to uh, dig up the road and do the rest of her things and the sidewalks and so forth. So, but the reason I'm here, or we're here, is, is basically um, I had passed out a, uh, a uh, um, information piece to kind of bring you up to date of where we are and so forth. But basically, Experience Hampton is a, is a group that uh, is used to promote and manage um, things in downtown Hampton. I think you know us a lot by the Christmas parade, but we've also done some other things in town. Um, we've, we were able to partner with the, uh, the town and put in a sidewalk that went from the uh, town parking lot. We've also put in a couple of these um, uh, crosswalks, one over by uh, Fast Eddie's That's and so right. forth that just yeah, recently happened. Nice. And we, we had helped fund those things. So a little history of this. Um, basically, in 2013, um, the town or the townspeople had voted an article to do a study for the downtown area. And that's basically what a charrette is called. Um, it was a, a meeting that was held. There was a, a input from business people, taxpayers, um, and, and volunteers in the area. We met, I think, about four or five times mm -hmm. but to try to come up with a, a plan to try to, um, to to look towards the downtown area. And so, um, and I know that. Uh, the, you know, just by putting those roads in and so forth that's happening is, is part of that. But I did hear Mark, you know, one piece where it talked about, you know, fixing the road, sidewalks, and so forth, and it talked about eliminating the power lines. So basically from there, um, if, if you remember, um, we've been kind of following this plan as it goes along, but then um, we had proposed Article 44 which uh, basically was an article that was uh, put forth behind the voters of uh, $300,000 to do a study to bury the power lines. Now, in that article, we said that um, we would raise 10% of that, and we turned the check over to the, um, the town for $30,000. So we, we basically became part of it also. Um, we've been working with, with Jen and Chris. Um, a great deal in, in putting together. I never realized that there's there's four companies there, that basically from Comcast to Unitil to a few other places, and it just kind of surprised us all. It it took a it took a while for us to get these reports, okay, or these studies that were done, and I think that you've kind of looked through them per se, and um, everything from you know um, Unitil you know, bearing things to, to the upgrade of the, of the services and those type of things. Um, there are three options in here. And basically, one option would be is to kind of a quasi go down Route 1 and then move the telephone poles to the back of people's properties. Um, and then that was kind of like plan one. Another one was to would kind of the other side and bring it down through the town parking lot. Um, and then, and our feeling was is that w what you'd end up doing is is if you move those poles to the back side, um, you'd have to get var um, uh, variances, but right away is from the uh, the railroad company and those type of things, and the chances of that are hap or happen would be very costly and and, exp and probably couldn't get done. I guess that's the feeling. So. Um, so we basically have put together a um, to, to look at the 11 million dollars which we had we had put into this plan, and we kind of went out and searched to see if we could find some money to do it because our our big uh, comment when we put Article 44 in was that we would not use taxpayers' money to do this part. The plus the plus that 
is out there is is that the road is going to has been dug up and uh, you know and so when it comes in the last time it would be it would make sense if it could be put underneath and be done with it it's I mean the easy one of the things that would look aesthetically better but also safety if you've walked down the sidewalks that are on route one some of the telephone poles are in the middle of the sidewalk and uh, I'm, I'm still kind of surprised that a truck hasn't run off and, and, and hit something like that but uh, um, you know, so those are the things that we we had looked at. Um, basically, what we had come across was this build grant. Um, a board member went down to D.C. just to kind of investigate it, and basically, it used to be called um, a Tiger Grant. Okay, and uh, there was an appropriation that was made in March, and it has a drop dead date of July 18th. But an application has to be completed. Um, we did a little searching and we talked to uh, Senator Hassan's office and also Senator Sheen's office and uh, they were excited about the plan and so forth and they would look to see if they could if the grant was approved not if the grant application was gone down that they would, would mark march it the best they could um, so basically this this is a an appropriations grant um, and uh, we checked a little further, and, and uh, one was it 150 million is designated for the state of New Hampshire. We already know that there's a couple of towns that are looking to apply for some grant money to fix some bridges and that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, basically, what we're asking today is is not to prove any money or anything. What we're asking for is. Um, is the selectman to vote in favor to have um, the town manager, the assistant town manager, and the, I guess the finance department um, take the time to fill out a grant application to see if we can get the money. If we can get the money, great. Um, I know there's been some discussion of, of uh, probably it might not pick up the whole thing, um, but our feeling is is that we would find uh, some private funding to try to to get that that middle of money that, that is needed okay and the feeling is is if we don't get the grant or the grant doesn't get approved down in in dc it doesn't happen if we get the grant and we can't raise the funds for the extra it isn't going to happen okay so basically what we're asking today is for an approval to apply for a grant and um uh, I wanted to have John kind of fill in. Yeah, I just uh, you just wanted to follow up a little bit with that. Is that you know we've you know we've done more than behind the scenes and meets the eye here, uh, and this isn't the only grant that we've looked at. We've looked at several state. Uh, we've looked at fed other federal grants. Uh, we looked at uh, the private public grant type of uh, uh, approach. Um, so these are, this is something that's been in the works for a long time. I was part of that uh, corridor charrette when we walked around town the first time and identified a lot of the, um, I'd say, uh, opportunities uh, for Hampton to, um, um, to get uh, a facelift and to address some of the issues that are uh, inherent in the town. They go from um, adequate parking uh, to uh, lighting, uh, to traffic flow, uh, in and out of access areas, uh, all kinds of things that we looked at, and the beautification of the town, and what that would accomplish um, going forward. Now, we know historically, just uh, from our own experience in Hampton, uh, that what happened down the beach uh, when, um, you know, the state moved in to make all of those improvements uh, has created a lot of uh, private development down there. Um, this is good for the, you know, tax base in town uh, to have that kind of investment. Uh, and I think the same thing would happen uh, if we pursued uh, this avenue with uh, very, very, very little out-of-pocket expense to the taxpayers, which is, was our goal in doing this. Um, so what we're asking you today uh, is to uh, let us pursue this grant. Uh, this is good for Hampton. And um, 
if we can get it done, um, you know, it'd be uh, it'd be wonderful. I have talked to several uh, people uh, that uh, are interested in what we're doing and um, are willing to support it both uh, with uh, financially, uh, if uh, if there is uh, some money that needs to be raised at the end of this, and it looks like there will be. Um, so I feel pretty confident that if this grant money comes in, this project will go. Questions Any questions? Always. Where to begin? Our public works department is under a tremendous strain at this point in time with the pipes in the marsh, all the reconstruction. It's a wonder they know what they're doing. The, uh, and we have the information here to remind us, and I remember when the charrette took place. We're talking about a fraction of this community. Uh, High Street, down Route 1 to Winnicott Road. Ornamental lighting. We have perfectly good poles there that give the same light that the neighborhoods get. I think this is one of the most frivolous things I have ever seen. I can't imagine using current resources which we haven't got. We got quotes here from Unitil, First Light, Fairpoint, and Comcast. Start with Unitil, which would probably be the most likely one to do this nonsense. Their cost estimate under option one is uh, option one involves constructing a new overhead pole line in the existing railroad right of way to supply the customers on the west side of Lafayette Road. The customers on the east side of Lafayette Road will be supplied from a new overhead pole line in the High Street parking lot and a new primary underground system from 24 Winnicott to 407 Lafayette Road. This option will require land rights from the railroad, town of Hampton, as well as several private land owners. The main challenges for the town with this option are the need for land rights from the railroad and private landowners and constructing and maintaining access to the infrastructure for future maintenance and emergency repairs. Like we have the time to do this That's stuff. That's not the option the that we're looking at, Mary Louise. I'm waiting. Okay, you good. talked, mm -hmm. I'm talking now. Cost estimate for the first option is $1,665,000. Option 1A is similar, but it's including placing the uh, street, high street intersections underground. And Mary Louise, Four they, million they, they said that I'm, the option they are going for is the one for all the burial. So that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about these other options. They are talking about the one for the burial. The ones for what? Total burial. underground, right? Total underground burial. Option three. And why? Option three. Okay, option so, three. Why don't we? Two million one hundred and sixty thousand. What are we doing here? This has to be one of the most absurd requests. This is this is an insult to the taxpayers of this community. You're talking about an extremely small section of town. This is the 21st century. We have existing light fixtures from Unitil. I have absolutely no intention of voting for any such nonsense as this. Uh, we have more challenges with waste in this town. And, and uh, I, I just, words almost fail me. I consider this a frivolous plan and I absolutely will not, under any circumstances, support it. Thank you. Regina? Okay, first of all, one clarification. Option three, total underground, the figure we're looking at is 11202725 correct? That's correct. So this grant, now I read all the details of the grant that you provided when you sent the email in to Fred. 80%, um, it looks like it's saying up to 80%, so that's like roughly 
I don't know, eight or nine million dollars, whatever it is, that you would get granted. And then if the other 20%, you would yet to be determined where that money would come from, correct? So that's fine. And I do want to say ahead of time that I'm well aware of all the projects that have experienced Hampton has done for the town and am appreciative of those, especially the Christmas parade, one of my favorite days of the year. <laughs> so thank you for that. But my concern is that this is called a transportation grant, and I'm unsure why, because we're talking about varying power lines. Yes. Um, and a DOT transportation grant, and then I see the word in a model in the application, concerns me. And it concerns me that maybe if Experience Hampton had signed the grant, I wouldn't be concerned, because it's not a municipality by signing the grant. But I'm not sure by starting this process what the town in the future on anything that Experience Hampton is trying to do might come back at the town, what might happen in the long run. So I'm uncomfortable. I'm also uncomfortable that I feel like the only reason we're hearing about this is because you need a municipality to apply. So I'm going to let my board decide, but my, my vote is going to be no tonight. Jim? Yeah, first of all, full disclosure, I was the only Selectman who rec not recommended Article 44 in the first place. So that's full disclosure there. But the thing is, Experience Hampton comes in with a vision. And they're a group of people, it's not frivolous. And I think, it, I think yes, it's it stupid frivolous. to call it frivolous. And I think it's stupid to call people names. So it's not frivolous. It's, it's a vision of what they want to do to the downtown. When I go to Concord, I went to Concord last year, and I hadn't been there for a while since I'd been a state rep, and they'd redone their downtown. And immediately it hit me, wow, this really looks good. And it really looks like there's a lot more people around town. A lot of things going on. When I go to Exeter, when they redid their, their, their sidewalks and stuff, it's really nice to go. When I go to uh, Newburyport, it's really nice to go and walk around. It, 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 it adds something to it. So what I'm saying is they're talking about going for a grant. Mm -hmm. And I believe when, you t when we're talking 80-20, that some of it could be in kind. I, I don't know for sure, but is that I, you know? I believe it means that so there, there that, ways that that part you're going to bring out during the grant yeah, process. Right. I mean, there are ways to get around having the taxpayer have any any you know Skin the game. liability here. So you know, I, I think we should work with it. any group that comes in with a vision that's trying to improve the town, that's not only trying to look out for themselves. I think we should work with them on a grant. I'm not saying we should. Um, I'd like to hear what Mr. Welch has to say. You've already invested $300,000 of the taxpayers' money in this proposal. Uh, actually, $330,000 were the assistance of uh, Experience Hampton. Um, it, basically, you've got two choices here. Just put this study that's been done or the work that's been done for the $300,000 on a shelf and forget it and say it's not worth anything. or try to get the federal government to pay for the work. Um, writing a grant is not that big a task. It can be done. Uh, and it may come to nothing, but then again, it may come to $20 million worth of work in the community. It's hard to say. You don't know until you write it. You don't know until it's been critiqued by the federal government and also by the state government because they have a stake in this as well. So. You've got a clear direction to go in. One path to, to take the $300,000 and just say it was spent and it's not worth anything, or to in fact file a grant and see whether it is worth anything. And you may come back with it's not. Don't so know. Do we have the time to do what needs to be to accommodate this request? Well, we Does your department a, have the time to do it? We filed a um, very large grant in six hours weeks ago to redo all of Winnicott Road, all the utilities, all the sidewalks, all the roadway, all the crossings, all the curbing, all the drainage, everything. And that was done in a period of six hours. It's possible to do it. And they have expertise in, in hand to help us do it. When are you going to find out the results of that? Uh, actually, it's already been filed and the Regional Planning Commission is supporting it. Okay. And I know that this is similar to the request that happened. Uh, for I believe it was seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for Smutty Nose to put in um, something on 
an extended sewer line so they could build their plant. So That's it's correct. similar to that, that we've done that in the past. We have. We've done a number of grants. Yeah. And, you know, I have no problem with um, doing the grant, but I will tell you that if it comes back and has to go to the taxpayers, I'll be voting against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the taxpayers not, that the board not support it. And Rick, our line has been that all along. Yeah. Okay. That's what we've, that's what we've Well, been I just want to make that clear forward. that I'll feel that I, you know, I'm all for doing this. I'm all for, I think we need practice writing these grants. Uh, so it sounds like a good practice thing to me. But in the meantime, if it comes back and the taxpayers are asked, I won't be in support of it. So I just have to throw it I mean, I think there. the biggest thing that, I mean, $11 million is a lot of money, okay? And it doesn't matter what it's for or whatnot. It's a lot of money. I think we were, we were, we were shell-shocked when <laughs> some of these reports started coming in, okay? Oh. We have no control over what these companies that come in for reports. <laughs> They're their telephone lines, okay? So um, it's, I think what we're trying to do here is, or we're asking for is, is, to, is to, I don't want to say finish the story, but, um, Finish what we wanted to do in that Article 44. Okay, and this is a, this is an idea. Okay, we have looked for other places to go and so forth, and it's not there. Um, so it's basically, I mean, this is for telephone poles. It's it's not for roads. It's not for sidewalks. It's not for lighting. It's telephone poles. So why is it a transportation grant? Don't get it. Because it's in the roadway. Oh, and it's not up for yeah. us to determine whether it's a transportation They're going to give us $9 million to fix a quarter mile of a road and, and we we'll not want anything back. And the yeah. thing is, if it does come down to that you have to raise some extra money, maybe you can actually ask the people that live in these areas if they want to <laughs> donate some money to have this happen. Because people, there are a lot of people that are at the beach are, are burying these things and yeah. they're paying for them out of their own money. You know, we've, so, we've got uh, a number of towns around. New markets, one of them. You go over to New Market and see how nice it is since they've redone their area. And because of that, a lot of the businesses that are in New Market are now flourishing, where before they were they were drying up and going away. You, you, you look at Exeter, the downtown Exeter, the same thing has happened there. You know, we're all small little towns with one road through. And if you leave Hampton the way it is, people are going to continue to drive through it. Yes, we may have traffic uh, telephone poles there now, but they're in the middle of our sidewalks. The street lighting is there. It, it could be adequate. It was adequate for 50 years ago. It needs to be updated. And I look at it as with a grant like this, if you don't ask for it, you're never going to get it. So the first thing you have to do is ask for it. And then if you can ask for it and the money can be raised to, to meet what the requirements are, it's a win-win situation for this town. So, Mary Louise. First of all, who's going to supervise all this? Public works is stretched to breaking. Mary number Louise. Number two, number two, number two. You had you speak. Yes, and I'm on the second go-round. Well. And you acknowledged me, so I'm making more comments here. Well, and I may move you out of order if you continue the way you're doing. You had your talk on it. Excuse me. We've been told. The public has been inconvenienced already for two years. Absolutely. Digging up for the sewer line and, and the water line and all the stuff on Route 1. It's inconvenienced the businesses. It's driving people crazy. And the last thing this town and the taxpayers want to see is ripping up Route 1 again. This town was founded in 1638. People are still coming to it but they want to be able to drive like civilized people, and we have more than enough on our plate. I absolutely refuse to Thank support you. this. I have a question based on on the 300,000. I was under the impression that, that almost 250,000 was yeah. going back to the unassigned yeah. fund balance. So we spent $50,000. It lapsed. And it? I'm all for people's ideas. But right now, we got one pipe supporting a whole entire beach that we don't even know what that's going to cost you. We just put a $13 million bond. And if we're going to spend time writing grants, yep. I'd say it'd be to bury the lines in the whole town. Yep. Okay. So my that's answer will still be no. Okay, now what was this called? It's what it used to be called Tiger Grants. It was now, a Tiger Grant. Now it's prior. called. It, it was a new, 
basically the Tiger Grant ex expired, okay, okay and through. Um, and the new system are? It's, it's, it's called a build grant. I, I'll build be honest grant. with you, I don't have the yeah. acronym. Well, I is. believe this is what, what, this is what has happened with the new administration. Um, they have gone to, the, instead of having Tiger grants, they've gone to these build grants. And what they are are private and um, they're partnerships. And that's what this is. This is exactly what the Trump administration is so doing. So why do today. they need a municipality if they're private public? Because it's they always they did before too. That's what we had to do with the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. This is something. But they tried to apply for it and they couldn't. That's why they're here. And no, I have a problem no, no, with no, that no. right now. It's, yeah, that's I, exactly. Did we had we did this before? I will tell you that with that yeah, seven hundred yeah. and fifty thousand dollars, the town applies for it. Not that it's this the is the way it always is. The municipality has to be with the one to grants. apply for that. Correct? This is the new way this is from the Trump administration these yes, I've grants. read the whole entire yeah. stack. well if yeah. this is the way it is today if you don't try it how, how you know I'm not saying that I'm um, happy that well, the the, grants I gotta tell work. you the federal grant gives us eight million dollars for a quarter mile of land something's wrong I don't care what yeah. administration yeah. it is well then maybe they're not gonna do <laughs> it All right, it's let's not get back right, to the, they're not, they won't do it the point so that's the point mr. Merrill that I see the you cannot apply for the grant. It has to be the we, municipality, correct? We have not applied for any grant. We haven't filled out any, any paperwork. We can't apply for this grant. It's a, it's a governmental grant that's available for municipalities. So the municipality has to correct. fill it. Right. We just, and that's, we just found it. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. And, that, and all you're looking to do is, is ask the town with your help to fill out the grant. To see if, it can, see if it's available. Can we would be more than happy to help with the filling out of the grant. Mm -mm. Yeah. And I make I, a motion and that we... One, one last thing, Mary Louise, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for anybody that, that serves on this board. It's not an easy job. Um, you know, I take my hat off to, to all of you. Um, but I've been around this town for a long time. My family's been around this I town for too. a long time. We both have, right? Yes. Okay, we've seen a lot, of, we've seen a lot, lot go down in the town. Um, New Market, I have happened to, you know, be guest lecturing at New Market during the period when they all those roads were torn up and and you know the townspeople were, you know, they, they were they were pretty bad. But if you go back and talk to the people that are in the shops now in New Market and you ask them if that was a good idea, they would say it was a game changer for their life. So I just want to put that in your head. These are jobs, real jobs in Hampton, real jobs. And people depend on this for a livelihood. And Hampton is really a gateway to New Hampshire. It's a gateway to the seacoast. It's one of the first things that you see when you get off exit one is Hampton. What a, what a statement Hampton could make. And that's all I'll have to say about it. Thank you. So Jim? I make a motion that we approve they're going for the grant. Do we have a second? Rick? All those in favor? Three. Those opposed? Three to two. We'll be looking to work on the grant. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the town has been notified that the cost of the disposal of demolition materials will be increasing by 66% from our current vendor. Wow. Un unfortunately, for those disposing of such materials, they should expect an increase in the cost of disposal of transfer station. We are working to mitigate that cost. So, pass through, so it has to be. It is a pass through, but we're working to mitigate because we, we have some other options we're exploring as to uh, what we can do for much less cost. We're trying to keep that within bounds. The Household Hazardous Waste Collection was held on June 23rd. 261 total vehicles brought materials for disposal. 60% of those disposing materials suggested that at least two set collections be performed annually, one in the spring, one in the fall. The total cost of the program was $12,840.40. That was $840.40 more than we appropriated, but we have the money in the Public Works uh, solid waste budget to pay for the difference. Aquarian reports that well number 22 is continuing its test run with the level of pumping having been turned off, uh, having been increased from 750 to 850 gallons per minute 
with no adverse impacts to date. Well 6 has also been turned off as it was last run on June 22nd. That's the well that we're having, aquarium was having all the trouble with contamination in. Mm -hmm. The Seacoast Science Center will be holding a floodplain management workshop, which was addressed earlier um, by the Chairman of the Conservation Commission. That's going to be held down at the Masonic Lodge on uh, July 18th from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Registration in advance would, is required, and while the workshop is free, a donation of $5 is suggested to help cover costs. The transfer station is open July 4th. Yes. And trash will be picked up on July 4th on the regular schedule. Emergency piping system from the Church Street Station to the wastewater treatment plant we hope will be in operation this week. They're, they're running that thing so quickly down the road. I'm, I'm amazed at the size of the pipe and the amount of work mm -hmm. they're doing to get it hooked up. Mr. Chairman, I have a number of other things. Uh, you'll probably remember, I know some of you have been notified, uh, that uh, last week the state on Friday at 4.33 p.m. ordered us to place a elevated bacteria warning on the North Beach. Yeah. Um, interesting to note that the following morning it was rescinded. Uh, this has happened a number of times in the last couple of years. Uh, they take the test, <clears throat> excuse me, during the day when people are up there swimming and there's a lot of children. Well, you know what happens sometimes in the water when kids are swimming and there's no, no bathroom up there. No. Uh, that leads to contamination in some cases. And if they take the measurement at the wrong place at the wrong time, it comes up with an E. coli uh, listing on the, on, the, uh, on the test. So It's a big ocean, Fred. It is a big ocean, but it's a small cove. So <laughs> it has that effect at times. Um, we've also been asked by the uh, Division of Fish and Game to let people know that um, there have been some bear problems in this county. <laughs> and if you got your bird feeders out, uh, the fishing game suggests that uh, you take another look because the, the bears have been raiding them in this area and also look to protect your livestock because bears tend to uh, like chicken for dinner and a few other things that may be around. Um, I told you about the demolition costs, the household has waste. Uh, we're having a problem with the downtown traffic lights, and I've ordered the Public Works Department, or the, excuse me, the Fire Department, who does this work, yeah. to look at the sequencing. Apparently, the sequencing for the red lights and the crosswalk do not work as you come out of Exeter Road Ooh. and make a right turn going up Route 1. Uh, the light stays green for that turn, and people have a Ooh. walk light mm -hmm. authorizing them to cross the road. So we'll have that fixed soon. Um, Query on number 22, we talked about, I have received a loan agreement from the state of New Hampshire for phase one of the upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is to our advantage because the state is going to pay $750,000 of this cost. Well, it's a darn good and thing. we don't have to have, if we take the loan through them, we do not have to have um, bond council go through the process and we don't have to go to the bond bank. Good. They'll float the money for us, and it's at a lesser interest rate than we can get from the bond bank. So Excellent. that's going to be sent back to them with approval to get governor and council approval this week, Good. because it has to be in by the 18th. So we don't need, I don't need the bond council letter because we don't need that. I think Mark has some things he needs to have done, too, uh -oh. with regards to this. <laughs> I have given you the draft, and I emphasize the word draft, warrant for the special town meeting. Right and would like to hear the board's response to that when you have an opportunity. We, we need to get that sort of finalized. Um, well, 22, we discussed. Uh, 1088 Ocean Boulevard, this has been a, an ongoing uh, revised condominium plan. It has caused some questions on our part, uh, and I bring it to the board only because I think we need to have an answer. Uh, the problem is that the property has been subdivided. The old condominium has mm -hmm. been now defuncted and a new one created. Um, but it has more than five units. And you're, uh, since it's a new unit, uh, same buildings but new unit, uh, does the board want to put into effect its current policy that is more than five units? They have to take care of their own trash or because it's an old unit being redone, 
we need to set some precedent here for the future because these are going to happen occasionally. Do we continue to pick up the trash for that location? Why was it? Why did they have to make it a new condominium versus the old one? They changed the property. They subdivided, changed the property limits. Mm -hmm. They moved some of the buildings. Uh, they had to bring it into compliance with the zoning ordinance. Which, so uh, is it more than five units? It's nine units. Okay, I'll make a motion that we do not pick up the trash second. right now. Have a motion and second. Any other discussion on that? I agree with that. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay, anything well, enough. Town Manager. Mary yeah, Louise. A couple of things. Fred, do we have a fixed date to meet with Aquarian this month? Tentatively, that's all at this point. Tentatively? Tentatively, because they have to schedule people to come up from Connecticut. Um, oh, that's too bad. And I'll, uh, we'll probably have that confirmed on the next day or two, right yeah. after the 4th. Okay. Because yeah, I was under the impression they were coming on the 16th. Well, that's the tentative date, uh, but that is tentative. Well, I, I hope the board is open because we're on the every other Monday now, but I hope right. the board is open. If we have to use one of the vacant Mondays in July, we have got to get this situation with the Aquarians straight. Yeah, or out. Aquarian can just come here on the 16th, like I thought, because that's what we've been talking about right, before. But, so. right. but it's going to be complicated. To <laughs> right. And we, we, we're, I'm just waiting for the final confirmation that everybody can be here Excellent. that day. Excellent. Uh, but that's the date that's tentatively planned for for them to be Because that's present. critical. We really, really need to get to sit down with them and get that one done. one of our planned meetings? Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, we'll just leave yep. it at that. Yeah, assuming that they can get here. I have a feeling that they'll be here because they don't want to stretch anything. Fred will be ferocious and make sure that they get here. Well, I'm not sure about the ferocious part, but <laughs> <laughs> we will cooperate with them to see if they can get here in time. Regina, you anything? Um, no, so the update on well 22. Thanks, Fred. And then so on the mosh pipes, we still don't know the exact date that they're going to be finishing up. We're hoping they're going to finish up before the 4th as far as piecing the pipes together. Yeah. Okay, we have our fingers crossed. Uh, good weather always helps. Um, they did this they're a little bit behind the original schedule they had simply because on uh, Church Street, yeah. we decided that the pipes needed to be buried. The too dangerous there on that corner to, yeah. to leave above ground for the entire distance. So uh, they'll be welding the rest of those pipes together coming down Route, route 101. Uh, and the bridge, the pipes on the bridge, I understand, were installed today. So we should be able to couple those areas up. They had to, the state required us to change the license again for bridging. And we had to put in uh, 45s yeah. on the piping system so to, to solve their problem. So. It's progressing very well, uh, and we're ready to hopefully to yeah. do the test come maybe Wednesday or Friday, one of the two. I guess the fourth just, is a pretty just, good day to have a test. Well, huh? not, yeah, that's if we, if we can do it that day and they're done, um, we'll see what happens. An amazing job by Public Works on that. It's been very interesting. I'm set. So, Rick? Um, so, <clears throat> on the bit about the north side beach, about the uh, fecal uh, contaminants, I heard from um, people that live around there that they feel it's dog waste uh, uh -huh. that's causing it. Excuse me. And I think that that's something that if in the future we're uh, uh, planning on having um, a code enforcement officer this is the type of yes. thing that needs to be addressed. Yep. Now, that's just one possibility, because yep. I have another idea of, I'm just curious what your opinion is. Um, is there a possibility that this problem could be the same problem that the state has been talking about that's coming off of uh, Woodland Road uh, and coming through Northampton with all the septic systems that are there? Because I understand it goes all the way, it's not just at the town beach. It goes all the way down to the, uh, to Northampton Beach also. It oh. does, and that's been a, a sporadic problem with contamination over the years. Uh, we're working with Northampton and the state. Uh, uh, as you know, there's a large wet area behind mm -hmm. uh, beach the point. town line. In, be, in between Hampton and Northampton, yeah. and that wet area has come up with some fecal coliform counts, 
<clears throat> to indicate that there's some material out there that's being disposed of in the marsh. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that we need to really be paying attention to this. This is something that, um, you know, this, this could be just seeping into the ocean. And if it is something like that, it's really disgusting. Um, it's and something not a pleasant thought. needs to be done. Good. Because I'll tell you, I went and had a skin um, cancer removed off my leg. And I was surprised when the, he, the, uh, the doctor said um, that, you know, definitely avoid uh, fresh water mm -hmm. uh, for lakes and whatever. And I wasn't surprised when he said that. But when he said, and definitely do not go into the ocean, mm -hmm. that surprised me. Ooh. Because he thought, said that the ocean is actually less, uh, there's more things that could bother an open wound in the ocean than there is in a swimming pool. That's true. So uh, ooh, I think that we need you, to be paying attention. Depending on where you go in, what the conditions are around it, yeah. they could be heavily contaminated. You just, you just don't know. That's why we test there several times a month. And um, this last test system did pick up a small phaco coliform count. Mm. Uh, in the past, that's gone away in less than 12 hours. So I, 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 I think it probably depends, greatly depends upon the number of people in the water at the time, particularly children. Uh, it, it just, it's a natural thing and, and hopefully it goes away. In this case, it did. They reversed that, that uh, posting within uh, 12 hours, for 24 hours. And uh, it's important that we keep track of that, those yeah. things though, because, and we do. Very regular. And I hope that we keep track of what's out there on the marsh that could oh, yeah. be coming mm -hmm. from Woodland Road. Yeah, we're working yeah. with Northampton on that in the state. As, to me, that's important. Thank it you. It is. Good, Rick. Any old business? Um, ah. Smutty Nose. Nice picture on the front page of the Hampton Union. Uh, they appearing, apparently, they're uh, running in good shape under the new ownership. Do we have the first documents? Signed, Fred. I know Mark uh, was was waiting for them. And do we have any kind of um, estimates on the pretreatment? They're still operating on a temporary license that was issued to the prior owner until such time as they come in with the full pretreatment system ready to be licensed in an operation. Uh, they cannot have an increase in capacity. Although I must admit, given the picture in the paper, those cans uh, were pretty big. <laughs> well, they're even bigger than the, the cans I saw from Australia, so they they're, they are pretty big. Um, but they can only produce a certain amount of uh, material. Uh, I'll phrase it that way within the course of a normal operation of the plant. Uh, everything else that they produce beyond a certain limit has to be trucked away and treated someplace else until they get their pretreatment system in. So it restricts their use of the plant significantly. And they are, we are testing them on a regular basis to make sure they're in compliance. Okay. Now, I like beer, I admit that. But we must have thousands of small breweries scattered across the United States. A lot of them are here locally. Some of them are probably required to use pretreatment systems. So they've got to be somebody out there, contractors, whoever they are, who can design these things and get them prepared. How long <laughs> are we guessing that we need to wait before we start getting growly? I guess we don't guess because there's no way to guess. They, they do currently have two vendors on, on contract uh, to review and to prepare a plan for their uh, construction and operation of a pretreatment system for the facility. Mm. So, uh, and I know that one of them has just finished a number of pretreatment facilities in Vermont. Ah. And I also know that in one of those pretreatment systems, the material that's being received from the brewery in Vermont is less than the total load for the residential system, which is very small. It's connected to the same system. So mm. it's a pretty good system. I'm hoping they would do such a thing here so that they wouldn't have <clears throat> any further problems, nor, nor where they would, mm -hmm. would we. But it's important that uh, they move forward with that. And I, it does take time. There's federal and state licenses that have to be yeah. acquired before they can, they can actually do the work. 
but time, 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 and I'm oh yeah, I'm going to end the industrial surcharge fee, which I hope will follow, which I hope we will have described to us at that time. Thank you, sir. All right, Dan. Anything else? Anything else under old business? Okay, new business. Dog warrant, unlicensed dogs. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman, we have 410 unlicensed dogs as of the editor of this warrant. Um, no, we can't print their names. <laughs> oh, the thought had crossed my mind. The current legislation does not authorize the town to do such a thing uh, and does not authorize us to post it. Town Council and I had a a lengthy conversation about it today. This warrant contains uh, 410 unlicensed dogs. Uh, Can we print the dogs' names? I don't think we have all the dogs' yeah. names. <laughs> no, we don't have the names on that. We have the description. Yeah. So that's about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. A lot of the people are dead, I can tell you, just looking at it. Yeah. yeah some 450? of them probably are. Um, Every one of these people have received I don't know several. What happens to the dog when they die, though? <laughs> um, it's it's take it with them or not. Yeah. The dog food budget goes down, I'm sure, but don't tell my wife they'll end up at my house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these, every one of these people have received numerous yes. written notices from the yes. town clerk. So I'll make a motion that we sign the, the dog, dog warrant. warrant. I'll second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Nemesis of an assault. Pass it around. We'll sign that. All right. uh, the uh, light at 19 Wayside Lane. Farm Shut lane. that up. Yeah. Way, far, wayside Farm Lane. Yeah. It's um, yes. <clears throat> we have a request to shut that street light off. This is a uh, 1990 subdivision. Um, the light. The light is supposed to be in the cul-de-sac area of this subdivision, and it is. Uh, it's not in the place that was originally planned on the planning board plans, nor is a transformer that sits in front of it. Both of them were moved, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, the plans filed in the registry of deed do not show them moved. But it's right outside the windows of a house, ah. and it's causing a nuisance factor for the house. It can be shut off at no cost to the town. Mm -hmm. the, the cost to remove it is approximately a thousand dollars. I'm not proposing the board do that. It's there uh, with a proper easement uh, against the property it's located on. My suggestion is we just take the electric eye that's have the utility company take the electric right. eye uh, and turn it off on top of the light and it won't shine. I'll second. I'll make that motion. Motion and second. And all those in favor? Yeah. Unanimous. We'll shut the light off. Accordance with the new letter of credit for McCarran Drive. That's a requirement for the planning board, and the, the figure has been verified. Ah. A motion? I have a what question for. I make the motion, first of all. all right. I'll second it. I have okay, a question. They just had additional building. Uh, they con they're constructing more homes in that area, on that yep. drive. I'm assuming they've started because there are huge trucks coming up and down Little River Road. Of course, we had a lot of that when uh, Woodland Road was redone. Is there any consideration anywhere when you have these big projects about the use of town roads? God knows we've got enough trouble with the roads right now. Is there any consideration for what the actual contracting trucks do to the roadways when you have these developments and they're going over and over and over? I know that's kind of a weird question. No, actually it's not a weird question. Uh, roads are designed for that kind of use, but over a period of time, no matter how well built the road is, it needs to be rebuilt. Correct. Uh, and the roads in that area uh, have been well traveled. Yes, well sir. used, yep, and they are taking additional weight because of the construction going on here and other places. Yes, um, but there's no, as long as they have a lawful permit to construct, we have to allow them to use the roadways. Okay, well, now, just makes me They deliberately me a little... destroy a road because they yeah. bring in a vehicle that's too yeah. big for the road. Yeah, and it digs it up, then they have to pay for that damage. I'm just getting a little growly. I understand. Okay. 
So, motion to accept the uh, new letter motion. Credit. You already made it. Oh. There's a second. All those in favor? I'm opposed. I don't Four like that one. development okay. at all. Yep. Vote not to use the PA 28 inventory for taxable property 2019. Um, this, the inventory of taxable property form uh, for 2019, the board either has to approve using it or send a notice back to the Department of Revenue saying that they will not use it. If you use it, then everybody in town has to file an inventory form. Yeah. We have to audit every single one of them <laughs> and go through the assessment file and check to make sure that they're assessed for what they have on their form I make or a go out and check it. it. Second. Motion seconded. All those in favor? My recommendation. Unanimous. It needs to be signed. I took care of that, Fred. Invitation by the town of Seabrook to participate in the 250th anniversary parade. Yes, sir. <laughs> we did receive such an invitation. Uh, it came on uh, June 8th, or it's dated June 8th. We came after after that. It's going to be Wednesday, July 11th, uh, and I believe I sent copies of this to everybody. Um, is there any desire on the part of the selectmen to, in fact, have uh, the town and uh, town departments participate in this activity? I would think if the town departments would like to participate, we should encourage that. Okay. What time is it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's on a Wednesday. Yeah, it's a Wednesday. Should we have a float? <laughs> no. No. The parade is scheduled Saturday, August 4th, 2018, August at 9 a.m. Okay. at the Seabrook Middle School. We have to get the reservation in by Wednesday, July 11th. Well, we're not going to be paying people to go there, are we? Right. No, but if, if, if departments want to send something and they want to volunteer to do it, I would suggest that yeah, we allow them to do it. That's a great idea. So yeah, that if yeah. we have a color guard or something that would like to go over, I would so encourage I'll that I'll make to that motion. I'll second it. All those in favor? Opposed. Okay. okay, four to one. Hazardous mitigation grant programs. What happened uh, to the federal grant application for expert witnesses? Yes. That's town council. Oh. Oh. oh, thank you. This is a follow up to the EPA community meeting on PFAS that uh, was first of its kind in the country that occurred uh, in Exeter. And uh, I'd like, first of all, if Regina could give an update to the board on that. Yeah, both uh, town council and I attended at the Exeter auditorium a great amount of people there. I don't know, a couple hundred people were probably there anyway. and. The town in my mind that sticks out the most was Merrimack. I guess they have some major problems with this. Uh, the science, I guess, isn't quite there as far as relating to the PFAS contamination. But mm. I got to ah. tell you, after listening to these people's stories, it's people of all ages, children of all ages, and it's scary and it's sad. Wow. And I'm glad the EPA hosted the community event. I think it was very helpful. The, I can't think of her name, but the district manager of Region 1 was there, and she seemed to really be, you know, taking it to heart. And I know Mark had some discussions with, I don't remember his name at the EPA, that's trying to work together and maybe seek a grant so that the Environmental Protection Agency with our state representatives maybe can go seek a grant to hire Tom Ballestero. Uh so that obviously the town of Hampton can't afford to mm -hmm. keep paying for expert services and I think if the EPA would be willing to do that that would be a great incentive to the community so are you so moving I want to make that am motion? I moving yeah. uh, I'll me, make the motion I'll yeah I want to just give a little more specific uh, having heard from EPA today on the subject oh good about the type of grant that uh, might be available Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Oh, one for the file. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, the uh, good. The, just for yeah. uh, interest, the town of Hampton so far has spent on Professor Ballestero approximately $6,900. Uh, Northampton has spent approximately uh, $1,700. And what we have gotten from Professor Ballester are two reports, one of which was back in December 
uh, one of 2017, mm -hmm. yeah. which uh, indicates the pathways by which contaminants, the PFAS contaminants, could flow from the Coakley landfill to a, a southerly and an easterly direction. Um, and the second was his report of uh, June 6, 2018, that's on the town's website, which uh, shows, in fact, that it appears that contaminants are flowing in that direction. Mm -hmm. And moreover, that uh, the current requirements that EPA has imposed on bedrock uh, investigation yeah. are not exploring those directions. They're merely exploring the north and northwest. And so EPA is open to uh, further discussion on the point, but Professor Ballesteros' continued involvement would be important. Uh, however, this board, I believe, has given some clear direction that it's time for other people to pick yeah. up the, the, uh, the program in this regard. And this grant that has been presented to me today uh, is one that would uh, involve the setting up of a separate community group to receive up to $50,000 of assistance for an expert in this regard. And there are some interested groups out there in the Coakley landfill site. Why we should be interested in the ultimate result is that uh, Aquarian is proposing a treatment facility mm -hmm. and has that will cost approximately $6 million that will fall on the ratepayers. To the extent that we can get other the money from those particularly who are responsible for this contamination can offset uh, that cost. Um, it, Aquarian, you'll find in two weeks' time, has applied, has filed a pre-application. Regina was critical in getting them to do this. Applied for a pre-application for groundwater trust fund money that could cover part of the cost. Uh, some of the other costs could be made up by whoever is responsible. And one question is, is Coakley Landfill Group partially responsible? And uh, Professor Ballestero is suggesting that should be further explored. And uh, the separate group that could receive this TAG grant cannot be a town or state. However, it can be a private group. Uh, and. Um, there are all sorts of requirements in this regard, and uh, what I would simply like to ask the board for support is for my office to use my time to uh, locate such a group and facilitate the federal government's working with that group to make an application. I'll make that motion. Right. Second. Second. Any other questions? All those in favor? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm in favor, but I also wanted to say, I don't know if I did, Aquarian did go, both Carol and John Hurley, he were there to give their side of what they've been doing as far as the testing and things yeah. like that. And I think the more people that can get in on finding out who the cul culprits are, I know Coakley is a big one, it's a super fun site, but yeah. it looks like there might be some other places that it could be coming from too, so. Good. Good. So we have a motion and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you very Mark. much. Good. Okay, now we have on here non-union wage impact. No, hazard mitigation grant programs. Yeah. Okay, hazard mitigation. Well, you just program. did that. We just no, did that. No, no, no. Mark. Federal no. grant. Yeah. yeah. Mark is doing. Federal grants you just did. There's a lot of grants going Number on. Number seven we got. Oh. I actually asked for this to be put on the agenda because. I'm on the wrong agenda, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been getting a lot of inquiries about this, and I don't know how to answer it, and I forward a couple over to the town manager. Because people are asking me whether or not the town is going to apply for hazardous mitigation grants. But I think that was explained a little bit tonight by Jay Diener. And it looks like yeah. there's going to be another workshop coming up on that in July. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if we could maybe clarify what the best thing for people that are looking to try to apply for this to do would be. I think the best thing that we could do would be to set up a program where we would have experts come in from the federal and state government and private engineering firms to sit and discuss this with people here, the people in town who are interested in this, these particular programs. They're all over the place. Uh, this is today's yield. There's about 50 pages here oh, wow. of material that just came in today on these grants. And they all say different things, and they're all for different purposes. 
Uh, no one seems to know exactly what these grants are, each grant is for. Oh. You've got to sit and study it and, and, and come up with the, uh, the resources to, uh, to put it together. As you know, we are going to be doing this year two major studies on flooding. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing we should dovetail into this because people don't understand what we're doing and they, they appreciate the fact we're doing something. They need some explanation of that, but they also need some explanation of how do they protect their property and mm -hmm. what happens in doing that, who pays for it, are there grants available for it, and what, what do the grants do? And they're all over the board. We need to put together some sort of select committee, hopefully with conservation, yeah. who deals with a lot of these wet problems all the time, yeah. and, and get it all taped so that we can play it back for people periodically so they can listen and try to understand what's going on. Yeah. I don't, because I don't really think anybody, single individual, really knows what's going on at this point. That's good, Fred. All right. Just my suggestion. Just on that, I'd recommend that people go to those workshops that Jay oh, yes. is putting on. Mm -hmm. I went to the last one, and it's very informative, and they're talking about a lot of stuff. And the next one is talking about flood insurance and home right. evaluation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's given a lot of this information that people are looking for. And it's out there, and they're presenting it. And I think they're taping their stuff, too. I'm not sure. I hope they are, because yeah. we'd like to replay it occasionally. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's, it's well worth going to. People should get out there if they're worried. I think that one of the mitigation grants that we received information on today is very comprehensive. But it, it actually says if you're going to place some barriers between water sources and the flooding areas, federal government can't be used. Money can't be used. Ah. That just means you have to let it flood. Yeah. Uh, that's not a very good grant, I and mean, we need to steer people away from those and into grants where they can actually have success. Right. You know, I would like to say too that I also went to the um, to the flooding, flooding um, seminar or whatever, and it was good, and there was some valuable information to sure. be taken out to be gathered there yep. but there's a lot of information that's not being had there and I noticed that the people that were there talking um, many of like the guy that was talking about flood insurance you know oh. he appeared to me that he was there probably from a business aspect of his own but I asked a basic question he couldn't answer it yeah. so all the answers aren't there either I mean, like, uh, we have, I have a, a, a hotel unit on the third floor, and I'm paying $800 for flood insurance on a very, uh, you know, that I have to have. The water will never, ever hit there. Then I had to, I have to pay, uh, the whole condo pays flood insurance for the first floor, which, again, it's, there's all parking on the first floor. The water would go right through. It would never, ever hit. He couldn't, that's a basic question, and mm. he can't answer it. Yeah. But more importantly, you can go to every insurance company around here, and they can't answer it either. Yeah. Nobody answer, knows how to answer it. But, you know, I, I just can't imagine how this goes on. I mean, in that condo, the, there might be an elevator that could be hurt, but certainly the uh, multi thousands of dollars that they pay for the basic policy for the building yeah. is enough to fix the elevator. Why on the th third floor I should be paying flood insurance when it will never ever hit me up there. And yeah. people at these seminars can't answer the question either. Yeah, you're right. It makes no sense. So you might find some information there, but you might not. And True. so uh, I, would, I wish that we had a way that we could come up with some answers, but I have gone to multiple insurance companies and finally I had to go all the way to Dover to get even to anyone to take it. Mm -hmm. so, it's, it's a difficult subject, a very yeah. difficult problem, and people are not having success at trying to resolve it. I think that, in my opinion, um, it's some type of a government <laughs> thing. I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense. Well, as you probably know, the flood insurance program of the federal government is bankrupt. Yeah. yeah. They do not take in enough money to take care of the claims. So if you live in a 60-story building and you're in a floodplain, each floor is going to pay something. Yeah. Whether you can get flooded, if you get flooded up to 60 stories, you know, it's it's pretty bad. You're not going to have to worry about anything else. But No. Uh, well, nobody else play, pays <clears throat> it. Uh, that's the worst part. People on the same floor don't pay what I pay. Oh, that's not right. It's just it's completely no. wrong. 
all the way around, and it's just something that it's a federal requirement. You have to pay it mm -hmm. if you have a mortgage. Yeah. And we just right. have a small mortgage, but. Do you remember a couple of years ago, I was in my prior term, when we had a, a get-together at Marston School with the FEMA yes. representative? Yep. And I can remember that night asking him, when, when you have a property that is flooded and they cash in on their flood insurance and then they rebuild and then a couple of years later that same property floods again, why would the government allow that if you if you didn't learn from the first time why are you doing it again and the guy looked me in the eye and he said uh, oh call your you know call your congressman because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of messes in the system where people have collected and collected and collected and they still are allowed to have flood insurance well depending upon the severity of the flood, yep. the amount of the loss, yep. the value of your property, yep. and the number of times it's been flooded and the government has had to pay off. Right. There, and we have two of those properties right down off of Brown Avenue uh, where they had multiple floods and multiple damages, and they've had multiple filings and the government paid off multiple times. They finally came back and said, okay, you've had enough damage now and enough payments out by the government, we're going to pay to retrofit your building. You have to contribute a certain amount, wow. but we're going to pay to retrofit your building. And both of those buildings have been raised. Their basements filled, their utilities moved, and the buildings raised. They're still going to flood. They're still going to flood, they're yeah, still gonna flood. Uh, because they're in a flood zone, yeah. Yeah. Anything well, else? No. All right. Non-union wage impact. Jenny, you brought that up. Um, yeah, I had some questions about we, I guess when we did that, a few weeks ago, we didn't talk about what the actual dollar figure was going to be, yeah. and I had some uh, concerned citizens about that. But I think we estimated fourteen, fourteen thousand ninety-eight dollars. Yeah, and 14, you have that within the budget. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's all I have on that and one. Then the good. Uh, Seabrook Nuclear Plant Evacuation Plan. Yeah, yeah, that's me again. Is there any? reason why we should be concerned i know there was some people concerned because of all the development and the bridge and that's an excavation route the evacuation route does not go over the hampton harbor bridge it doesn't it does not because it's too close to the plant okay the evacuation is either to the north or to the south of that point uh. and then to the west uh. Okay, and do people actually know what to do if we were to have an evacuation? Of not. <laughs> well, if they read the material that's given to them each year, they would know yeah. where they were supposed to go. Uh, however, the evacuation either. routes are not marked. Every year right. they send they out not, a calendar. Been I don't, oh, what well, that yeah. thing but they can, put on. Oh, that okay. has all the information on it. Uh, yeah. Uh, my okay. feeling on the evacuation route marking is they should be marked. The nuclear plant should be paying for that marking, yeah. and the state should allow them to put the, the signs up. However, there is a state law prohibiting the erection of those signs right, yeah, on we've state highways. Yeah. And and it's 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 one of these things where you got to do it, but you can't do it. Yeah, it's well, like no. the flood insurance. It's another thing that right, makes exactly. no sense. Yeah. Yeah. But the most accessible information there is is that calendar that. Right, and that, yes. that has yeah. the most updated, yeah. and it's done yearly. The yeah. school's okay. supposed to take all the kids out to the west. Yeah. The and the teachers have, are all going to run home, and they're not going with the kids to begin yeah. with. The schools so, have protocols. It's just yeah. a mess, yeah. and there's there's yeah. no. It's just ridiculous. Okay, no I know, but for some reason, it. this is all like coming out of the woodwork right now. So I. Just it's been figured, coming out of the woodwork for years. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been getting bombed lately with it, so I just wanted to bring it up <laughs> in right. one of our meetings. Yeah, it's a good okay. idea. <laughs> Closing comments. Oh. None. We are going to have, go into a non-public after this. Right. Ninety-one motion. We oh going to non-public. Yeah. Going yeah. to. Uh, uh, my understanding is you want ninety-one hyphen capital A colon three Roman two small a <laughs> personnel. Personnel. Correct. Yeah. Okay, make that motion. Second. Motion. And a Second. roll call votes needed. We need a roll call. Yeah. 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 Aye, aye. Uh, aye. Rick. I, uh, I, and we need a time when we're going from this. We are going in at 9-11. 9-11. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Channel 22.